The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners, and welcome to episode 190 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. My name is Jason A. Meiske. I am your host for this and every episode of the show. And uh, man, just a little reflection there. Oh my gosh, 190 episodes. I, that's just amazing to me. That uh, I mean, it just seems like yesterday I was starting the show and then all of a sudden I had an episode 100 coming up and I did a big celebration for that. And you know, honestly, right now I don't know if I'm going to do anything for episode 200. It is a big milestone, but uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I've got 10 more episodes. That's still two and a half months if I'm doing one, you know, one a week between now and then. And uh, honestly, I've got a lot going on right now in my personal life. Some things have come up very recently. Um, well, a family family member has become uh, very ill and is in the hospital right now. And... Um, we're, we're hopeful. We're, we're praying constantly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that, uh, a, uh, a healthy solution will come out and, uh, that he'll get to come home soon. If you are one who, uh, prays, you know, or if you just want to send some positive vibes our way, then I greatly appreciate that. But that, uh, this event has kind of turned some things upside down. We've all been, everyone in the family is working together to try and juggle, you know, uh, <laughs> juggle kids and our schedules and work schedules and everything and it's been a little nuts um but you know what you didn't tune in for all that L- like i said that's just kind of throwing some things off uh for i'd been considering whether or not to do something for episode 200 but for right now i think i'm just going to wait and see how things go the next couple of weeks and uh, go from there but meanwhile meanwhile we're not gonna we're not here to discuss anything that's going to bring you down we're here today specifically to discuss Dr. Eva Shaw, historical mystery author and very accomplished and well-renowned ghostwriter. Uh, Eva joins us to discuss uh, trusting your inner writing sense, how she turns the writing practice into a game, uh, writing with imaginary friends, <laughs> which is fun, and, and what you need to do to put your characters in a pickle, you know, how the importance of that, putting them in a pickle and making your characters squirm so that, that way characters grow and uh, the readers have something to uh, to hang on to from page to page. So much great stuff and uh, including we're going to do a little chat about a, a nonprofit group uh, that's very close to Eva's heart which is the Days for Girls nonprofit organization. And what's really cool is that 50% of the profits for her new book, which is the historical mystery called The Seer. It comes out September 14th, and the pre order is available right now. But 50% of the proceeds from that will go to this nonprofit organization, Days for Girls. And lots of good things that they are doing there. And for more information about that organization, click the link in the show notes to learn all about that. But you're going to hear some about that as well during our conversation with Eva Shaw. And then she gets into her reading for uh, the upcoming book, The Seer, which, uh, yeah, it, it is historical mystery, but it's also got a little bit of intrigue. It's got some uh, some suspense and uh, a little bit of uh, almost, uh, almost a feel of uh, espionage going on during World War II in New Orleans. So a lot of great stuff, and it's a great sample chapter. One I look forward to sharing with you here in just a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, uh, I do want to announce, I, I promised you all, you would get to hear this first, so editing and writing on my next book, The Bandit Chronicles, book one, is going very well. I'm trying to fit it in anywhere I can, and just frantically going on it, and uh, it's every time I sit down to work on it, I feel like it's getting better and better. Uh, I, I should be finished with the edits on that this week, and I'm shipping it out to all my beta readers who are going to be checking it out. Um, if you're interested in being a beta reader, I, why not? I'll just open this up to anyone who's interested. If you would like to be a beta reader and uh, check out the book and uh, see what you think of it, 
um, you know, then uh, let me know. Reach out to me at the show here at Sample Chapter Podcast at gmail.com and let me know that you're interested. And I'll happy send you along an electronic version of it so you can do that. The only thing I ask for is that you read it and then send me your notes, what you think, uh, what might, uh, what uh, doesn't work if you think that there's something that's not working. Uh, and then whenever the book comes out, if you would post a review, I'd really appreciate that as well. It'd be kind of like an ARC team. Uh, but also, starting on the 1st of September, that's when I'm going to do the, the big cover reveal. So uh, I will share that with the show as well. But the main portion of that's going to be on my website, uh, my website links. So uh, author Jason A. Meiske's uh, Facebook page, Twitter page. And then, of course, on my website, I'm going to share the artwork there, uh, which is jasonamiske.com. So um, if you want to see it first, go there, but I will share it with the show later on. Uh, but it'll be easier to follow if you go check out those other locations, because I don't want to I don't want to take up all of the sample chapter time to talk about myself. <laughs> um, you know, this is here. The show is here for my guests and not so much for for me. That being said, that's all happening right away. The cover art will be revealed on September 1st, and I should have a pre-order set for it real, real soon. So look for that as well. Well, I want to thank our sponsor, Scribner, uh, my favorite writing software and the software I've now written a few books on, you know, including the Bandit Chronicles. Uh, no need for me to go into it too much because I got this wonderful ad playing for you right now about Scribner. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scribner. Now, I know you've heard about Scribner because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scribner's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scribner every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scribner Writing Software, built by writers for writers. All right, thank you so much to Literature and Latte. That's the website and company behind Scribner. I uh, love having them, um, being a partner with them again, and getting to share that uh, coupon code with you so you can save 20%. Hey, I also want to thank um, the new affiliate we have for the show, which is Writer's Block Coffee. I talked a little bit about that last week, uh, but I was not prepared because I was trying to rush after <laughs> Comic-Con. I was trying to rush to get the episode ready. The show is now an affiliate for Writer's Block Coffee. They offer three different flavors. There is their signature flavor. It's a mild one called Writer's Block, <laughs> which is great. I have a sample of that on its way. Uh, the uh, Deadline Dark, which of course that's their dark brew with a secret ingredient included into it. And what I'm thinking will be my favorite. We'll see. I've got, I've got a serving of this coming to me as well. The Whiskey Barrel Aged Blend. And, uh, oh man, I can't wait to try that one out. That's, uh, that's where their coffee is stored in an aged whiskey barrel for 30 days to soak in that flavor and the smells. And, oh, that just sounds incredible to me. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, I, I mentioned last week that I had some samples on the way and I was wrong. I thought I never did complete the order and I didn't even realize that until this past weekend. And so uh, the order is now on the way. I, like I said, I've got a sample of writer's block. And then I have a, a bag of the whiskey barrel on the way as well. And uh, yeah, some great stuff. I can't wait to report back to you next week when that coffee shows up. Gosh, I, I was thinking it was going to be here today, but uh, it hasn't shown up yet. But anyway, great stuff. Um, you want to make sure you click the link in the show notes for uh, how to get over to Writer's Block Coffee, as we have a specific link for that, that's going to save you 10%. And make sure you type in that code, sample chapter at checkout. And uh, it, whether you use the link or the code sample chapter, uh, one or the other will give you the 10% deal. So you make sure you, you do that whenever you're checking out. 
Okay, well, I also want to thank our podcast friends, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network, home to about half a dozen shows, all of them pop culture related. So whether you're looking at movie news, TV news, celebrity gossip, uh, what's happening in the Marvel Universe, you know, this week, or what's going on in DC, gaming, wrestling, uh, everything pop culture. You get the idea. It's all right there at the Pop Goes the Culture Network. Uh, once again, I want to uh, throw a bone out to my buddy there, uh, Tony, with Multiverse Tonight. Uh, just a fantastic show. He's got lots of, uh, he's been uh, getting back at it, his episodes after Comic Con. And uh, in fact, his most recent episode, he discusses the trip to Comic Con and what uh, what all he experienced there, and it was a lot of fun to listen to. So make sure you click the link in the show notes for the Pop Goes the Culture, and you can hop over and check out his episodes or all of the other shows available on that network. I also invite you to check out Project Entertainment Network, home to about 30 different shows of a very wide variety. Whether you're looking for writing tips or book reviews, shows about monster movies, uh, comedy debate, uh, bizarre fiction, people just talking about whatever comes to mind, all sorts of things available, all sorts of shows available there at Project Entertainment Network. Uh, this week I'm going to call out my uh, my friend Jim Adams at Monster Attack. Uh, his most recent episode, he is discussing 1961's The Innocents. And uh, it's a great show, it's a great podcast and uh, one of my favorites over there check out this advertisement for monster attack this is jim adams from monster attack hey if you remember that monster movie from your childhood that got it all started for you the one that really got you interested in monster movies horror movies sci-fis and cult films then you're going to want to listen every week to monster attack we look at some of our favorite monster movies from the 50s 60s and 70s with new episodes uploaded every monday it's monster attack exclusively on the project entertainment network Okay, well, there you go. Like I said, that's a great show, uh, one that you can check out. All those old monster movies. Gosh, I remember I remember watching so many of those on Saturday mornings. Uh, maybe not mornings, but it would be uh, back in the day, you'd have Saturday morning cartoons. After they were all done, about midday, they would start showing some of the old uh, monster movies would come on. I remember watching like Godzilla and just all sorts of wild shows would come on and Depended on whether or not, you know, where I was. If I was at the babysitter's house, she didn't care what we were watching. <laughs> if my mom was there, you know, and she didn't kick us out of the house to go play outside, then maybe we'd get to watch something for a while, and, or at least for a while, until she realized what we were watching. And she's like, oh my gosh, turn that off. Get outside. Anyway, all of those shows, including Monster Attack, are available at the Project Entertainment Network. So click that link in the show notes to find all of them. Hey, um, all of my podcast friends, uh, sponsors, and affiliate, they all have social media links, uh, so make sure you go and pull them up on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, just like us, we also have social media on each of those platforms, and very easy to find, Sample Chapter Podcast, at your choice of social media. Uh, you want to make sure you follow us along there. I do share the... Uh, each week's episode a few times on there talking about different tips each time each time i post about it i try and share something different and of course the image of the book is available in that post as well i also share old episodes and uh, you know throwbacks and uh, anytime my t public store has a sale going on i want to make sure and share that as well so you can if you want to support the show you can go over there as well and order yourself some sample chapter merchandise uh, we do have new designs coming very, very soon. Um, if you are not a social media person, but you'd like to reach out to the show, you can do so at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com or leave me a voicemail by calling 1-660-851-1146 and then listen to the upcoming episode where you might hear your voicemail. All right, well, I have blabbed on enough. Uh, it's time to get us on over to our interview with the delightful Eva Shaw. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Welcome back. This week, I'm I'm very excited. Uh, you know, and and that's 
as you know, anybody who's been listening for a long time, excited is like, that's just my go-to term. But what can I say? I have a very special guest with me today. We have one of the most, the country's premier ghostwriters in Eva Shaw. Uh, not only is she one of the premier ghostwriters of the country, she is author of more than a hundred award-winning books. She also teaches five university-level writing courses available online at 4,000 colleges and universities worldwide. Uh, additionally, she's also written thousands of articles, essays, and short stories. And here today to discuss her uh, her brand new book that is her own, which is called The Seer. Eva Shaw, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. And as I have been telling people for a long time, write the book that you want to read. And that's what I've done with The Seer. It's a historical mystery. It was a lot of fun to write and um, something that most writers don't seem to know and readers just glance over is the editing process is the grueling part. And uh, it took me at least 10 times through the book to get it close to where I wouldn't be mortally embarrassed to have people read it. <laughs> that is that is something. I my first book off and on took me about seven eight years, and then another uh -huh. another year and a half of editing after that. Oh, yes. And it's gotten faster since then. It's like I'm, I'm able to get that first draft done right away. Uh, but yeah. yeah, the editing is always taking much longer. It does, and that it, only on television do people like uh, movie stars write books and immediately they become bestsellers. No, the editing part <laughs> is part of the writing. Mm -hmm. And I just turn it into a game, so it isn't too painful. Oh, all right. Well, I'm interested in that. How, how do you turn it into a game? I give myself a carrot. Uh, <laughs> I say, okay, if I can get uh, 20 pages done today, then I get to do this. And if I get this done, I will do that. I'll get to call a friend. I'll get to I, – I also paint, ho not houses, uh, canvases. And um, I get to practice my banjo lele. I'm learning to read music. It's very – this was on my bucket, my pandemic bucket list was to learn a stringed instrument. And um, so I'm learning the banjo lele is like a hybrid between a ukulele, as they say in Hawaii, and a banjo. And it has that honky tonk sound. Mm -hmm. It's just marvelous. Yes. Oh, very nice. Now, do you do you have like set hours? Do you like to get up in the morning to do your writing and try and get it done, or is it an evening kind of thing for you? Oh, I, I'm a morning person, and so after. Coco and I uh, take a walk. Coco is my little Welsh terrier. After she and I take a walk, at least m um, two miles, because she's a high-energy girl, uh, then I spend the next four or five hours teaching, ghostwriting, writing the novel, whatever I'm working on. And then later in the afternoon, two to four, I come back to my office in my home and um, start again. Oh, okay. Wow, so I'm, that's a full day. Pretty, yeah, uh, I'm not good in the evening. Past 8 o'clock at night, I'm just like inter-zombie lo <laughs> zone. <in. laughs> if you call me, then I will totally forget that you have called me. But throughout the day, it's busy, and I, and I love what I do. I pinch myself every day, figuratively, uh, that people actually pay me to write, and they buy my writing. It's such a wonderful career. Oh, my gosh. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the world. It, I just love it. I do, too. And it, it's almost, I assume, I'm not an addictive person, but I, I think I'm addicted to writing. I just love it so much. It really is a, uh, a fascinating thing to sit down with other people's voices in your head and to scribe that and, 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 and describe what they're talking about in a way that makes other people interested in it. And the euphoria, or euphoria that comes from that is really indescribable. It, it's amazing. It is. Little black squiggles on a white piece of paper. <laughs> and I put those down and somebody else picks them up and they understand my black little squiggles on a pa piece of paper. It's, it's mystical almost. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, one of the things uh, that you talked about is you do some teaching about ghostwriting, and you are also a well, highly published uh, ghostwriter as well. Now, how did you get started with that? Oh, it was one of those things where you just fall into it and you say, wow, this is it. I had been uh, an editor at a fitness magazine probably way before you were born, and uh, they sent me out an assignment to interview a then very uh, famous fitness expert with her own spas and lines and so on, and we were having coffee after the interview, and I said to her, um, you know, you really should write. And she turned to me and said, I don't have time. Could you write for me? Mm-hmm. And there it was. And if I don't advertise, I don't look for clients, but they come to me and the most fascinating people in the world. I get to join their lives for a time and hear their secrets, too. And they expect good writing. They expect deadlines met. And I'm paid very well. Yeah, I mean, and you're you're writing self help books, memoirs, uh, other yeah. gift books, all sorts of things. It's yeah, a remarkable I, career you put together. Well, it's all it's all writing, Jason, and good writing is good writing, and I hope that's what I give my clients, and I hope that's what I give my readers in my novels, because that is a part of my mind that I really truly enjoy and you hit on it in the fact that we're talking to our imaginary friends and <laughs> <laughs> oops if you're if you're not a writer you might not understand that actually I had a psychiatric nurse one time sit in a class and she said if you're talking to imaginary friends you might want to get counseling and I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but we do have imaginary friends, and I have other writers stop in and talk to me, and I go to their house or have coffee, and we talk about our imaginary friends and without any shame to it, and it's wonderful fun. <laughs> my my wife and I are going to be celebrating 25 years coming up here soon, and uh, I think she's finally getting used to... Me sitting in the chair next to her in the living room will be kind of half watching, half not watching something on television. But I've got my laptop open and I'm talking. She thinks talking to myself, uh, but I'm not. And she's finally gotten used to that feeling or that me doing something. And she stops asking me what? Because I've learned to call her out and go, hey, Holly, I need this or I need to talk about that. But now she knows to just ignore me. (laughs) And you gotta ask your que- You gotta have tough questions for your characters. Don't just let them off with the easy stuff, because they. And again, it sounds psychotic, but they know where the story's going. They know what to do. So we need to trust that inner sense as we write. Oh, that's and so right. we we also know when we're writing drivel, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Or if we write something, I call them golden words, and those golden words have to go. I've I've tried to save an entire chapter just for a couple paragraphs that I thought were brilliant, and then I thought, nope, that's the problem. I'm turning the book into something I don't want to save these, and they've just got to go. That is a perfect segue into uh, my next question, which is about valid research. And Mm -hmm. I I know exactly what you're talking about uh, as far as I have researched things for hours or days to learn (laughs) something, only to later on have to cut it completely out because it does not serve the story at all. It's true, and I'm I'm like a squirrel with a shiny object. Ooh, look at that. Okay, I'll research (laughs) that for a couple hours. Um, I thoroughly enjoy research, and I'm always asked, how do you know when you have enough? And I think it's a gut feeling, and maybe you can add something to it. But once I have information that I've got the big brush stroke picture of it, then I can find other details that I might want to add. And at a point, I say, okay, enough. I could spend my entire career researching the life cycle of a uh, monarch caterpillar and um, forget what I'm working on. So I am 
I am a very goal-oriented person. And also, I like to finish things. And as a friend, Jackie Landis, once told me, perfection is the enemy of done. If you're trying to get perfection, God bless you, it's not going to work. So get to it, finish it up. You can always go back and edit and edit and change. But you got to get some words on paper to play with. Yeah, there, there's definitely a level of self-control um, uh, that you have to have with the research because I don't think anybody can just look something up and, and you know, any any writer is able to just look something up and go, okay, what's the definition of this? Okay, great, go back to it. Uh, or <laughs> where did this come from? Okay, great, got it, go back to your, your writing. No, we've got to go down this rabbit hole for a little while, and then it's, okay, I feel good enough, and I know the history of this and what was involved and who developed it and who did this. All right, so the answer is no, and continue on. And <laughs> mm -hmm. But you've got to have that control and know that, okay, I just spent an hour on something um, – that doesn't fully fulfill what I'm looking for for this one line in a paragraph. Mm -hmm. you, uh -huh. And you got to be able to come back to it. And I think that's all about experience, isn't it? That mm -hmm. um, I'm often checking the thesaurus for a better word, and like nine times out of ten, I come back to the first word I've used. But I have to check it. I have to <laughs> say, do I? Does that sound good? Um, and silly words that we come upon, and I'm a deadly Scrabble player, so I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> but silly, silly words we come upon, and I have to know the meaning of it. But I can't take two hours to find the meaning, meaning of it. I need to get with the research. Does that word fit? If not, go back to a simpler word. Exactly, exactly. But at the same time, valid research is essential to the story. What, what does that mean to you? That means reading Wikipedia but not using it. <laughs> uh, and we all use Wikipedia. I mean, I, you know, if I need to know the square mileage of uh, North Dakota, yeah, I'm going to go there. But it means delving into sites that truly are valid and checking them. When I first began thinking of a book based in World War II New Orleans, and I am there. I, I consider New Orleans my second hometown because I love it so much. Um, I had never heard of Camp Algiers, which was a POW camp across the Mississippi, or across the river as it's called, uh, from uh, New Orleans, mm. where it held both Nazi sympathizers and Nazi war criminals, and um, fleeing Jews from Europe, and and they held them together. And I was absolutely mortified and fascinated. And so I spent a lot of time with that, learning about it. Yes, research that's valid, that's true, has to be in there. Of course, if you're writing science fiction, you can make up your own details, but stick with the details. Stick mm -hmm. with whatever world you're writing about. And in my case, I wanted to throw in some historical, not hysterical, but historical characters <laughs> um, like Charles de Gaulle and Eleanor Roosevelt and things that were really trending at that time. So I had to do some real research. And if you flub on those facts, I swear there's a retired English teacher in Bangor, Maine, who will point it out and write letters to the editor <laughs> of your publishing house and complain about you. <laughs> <laughs> You've met that person, right? <laughs> I, I have, yes. I have received those letters, yes. Uh, you've got to get some just enough details right that uh, it resonates with the people in that area. So they go, oh, yeah, I know that corner. I know where you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that was one of the fun things about writing about the French Quarter in New Orleans is because I know it and um, I could smell it. And I, I've been there on Mardi Gras Day when uh, people are marching down the street with a drink in their hand and wearing tutus and waving magic wands, <laughs> gentlemen who should not be wearing those things. And um, just feeling the essence and the excitement of the city even during World War II, when things were pretty subtle and much of it went underground. Yeah. 
So, so why, uh, why New Orleans and why, uh, pre, or, or why that era as well, the, the uh, World War II era? I, I am drawn to that era. I, if you haven't been to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, it is a feast for the senses and truly one of the best museums I've been to, and I'm a pretty much a museum junkie. And after a number of visits, I thought about how the fear of World War II would affect the population being right there on the Mississippi. And it is documented that uh, Nazi uh, war boats were in the Caribbean and, of course, established in Central America and uh, South America. And the fear was that the Nazis would take over the Panama Canal and mm -hmm. cripple America. Mm -hmm. And so why do these people have the fear? And during that time, there was, when I was writing it the last three years, um, there, before the pandemic, there was a lot of fear with politics and a fear on a local levels with unrest. And I was curious how the average person would fear going about their day uh, with that fear in mind, and who would they turn to? And I thought, well, who would they turn to better than a psychic, even though my protagonist is a fake psychic, and that's established early on. <laughs> yeah, and everybody, we're talking about Eva's book, The Seer, and I'll, I'll read the synopsis from it here real quick. It's, uh, it's February 1942, War Grips the World, Asian Hate Runs Rampant, and New Orleans is a dangerous place for Chinese-English scientist Thomas Ling as he collides with self-proclaimed psychic Beatrix Patterson. She's a good liar with an excellent memory, which in truth is her only gift. Well, that and conning the well-heeled out of their money and secrets. <laughs> it sounds incredible. This is a wonderful uh, hook for it. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> job then jason thank you <laughs> yes so what would happen to these characters and you can practically talk to them because they are going to find themselves in a pickle as my mama used to say and um we want our characters to squirm a lot we you know it would be boring to say oh they had a happy life a happy marriage three happy children and then they retired to florida boring <laughs> we want to make our characters do things and feel things that we may not have done exactly, but we know uh, most of us have lied at one time or another. And I'm curious often, and I've fallen down that research rabbit hole, of why people lie and um, how they do it and how people know if other people are lying. It's just, it's a... I may have to write more on lying here. <laughs> it's just curious <laughs> to me. Oh my gosh. Well, it's, it's a fascinating idea and it, it seems to be rich with uh, possibilities. So uh, I know I cannot wait to uh, find out more about this and, and to hear your, your sample chapter coming up. Uh, but along with the, with the book, uh, I understand you're also providing 50% of the profits for a nonprofit organization. Tell us a little uh, bit about that. I would love to. It's a, it's very close to my heart. The organization is called Days for Girls International, and you can find it online, Days for Girls International. It provides sanitary products and possibilities of work for girls and women throughout the world who may not have that advantage. And as a middle-class white woman, I never thought about it until... The founder, my friend Celeste Mergens, um, was visiting Africa, and she asked some of the girls, well, what do you do when you have your period? And they said, well, we stay in our room. We can't go to work. We can't go to school. And because they are women and shut off when they have their periods, they live a life of poverty. And that is a human rights issue. It's not just, oh, well, give the girl something. This is a human rights issue if they're being denied work and school, education, and 
a level of income that men are getting, sorry, Jason, but <laughs> men are getting just because they're men. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is what Days for Girls International is trying to change. And I'm very proud and humbled to be able to help them any way I can. And everybody who buys a book will, 50% of the profits go directly to this bare bones organization. That's wonderful. That is really wonderful, and and that is something that I'm I'm well, I'm not familiar with a portion of that, but I'm very familiar with being looked upon in a certain way, being prior military, and my wife is also prior military, and it was unique that we would go someplace, and even though she's staying there in uniform, and somebody says, "Oh, you're military," and then they look right at me and go, "Well, thank you for your service." And I'm like, "Uh." Do you see the woman right next to me in uniform? <laughs> That's who you need to be thinking. <laughs> so, yes, it uh. did. And we, we humans make assumptions about people, too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a absolutely. But Beatrix Patterson, my protagonist, my main character here, is a very strong woman. And I think all women have that in them. I mean, for since the beginning of time, we've been birthing babies and burying the dead. And um, these are, it's time we, I won't get on my soapbox. We already talked about that, Jason. <laughs> but, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing how proceeds from the book can even help one girl, one woman out of poverty. And then the book will be a success. Uh, indeed, indeed. Well, that, that's a, a well-worthy and uh, wonderful thing that you're doing, and, and I, I I hope for the best with it. I hope it turns out really well. And everybody I listening, hope... you got to go yeah, pre-order the book for right girls. now. Yeah, and uh, order the book and support the cause and really look into it because to partner with them on this is just something that's going to be bigger than all of us, I know. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm going to make sure and have a link for the, in the show notes for that Thank website, you. so that, that way people, everybody listening, you'll know you can just click that link and get right over to the website for Days for Girls, uh, of course, as well as where to find and follow Eva Shaw and uh, and her books, so that, that way you can uh, follow up on all of that, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so what's uh, what's next for you? Well, I am... Working with a client in New Orleans, one of my favorite people on the planet, writing his life story as a ghostwriter. So we're working on that. And I'm working on a sequel to The Seer, tentatively called The Pimp, because <laughs> there is a lot of skullduggery still happening in the world. And it's going to be taking place in Santa Barbara, where my uh, protagonist grew up and where I spent part of my childhood and so I know that city well too and the secrets that it could have and I just love to write so I'm having a wonderful time with this hopefully it that will be out next year because I know with my favorite authors I wish they would write faster it's really rude that it <laughs> takes them a year to bring out like Louise Penny one of my incredible um, uh, authors that I follow um, has a new book coming out next week, and I can't wait to see your podcast. And I can't wait. <laughs> I'm, I, I am a true Louise Penny groupie, Jason. <laughs> so, and and Debbie Maycomer is just a in, f wonderful, wonderful friend and author. And I wish she would write faster too. So <laughs> uh, I'm I'm working on the next book. Thank you. Oh, wonderful! And you said something interesting there in the uh, uh, how you're writing. You're, you're writing two different things, completely different things, at the same mm -hmm. time. Do you like uh, d that? Doesn't give you any problems? You're able to do that and keep them separate. Oh well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, I, I'm a working writer, uh, Jason. I. Um, People say about writer's block and so on. Gosh, I hope my hairdresser doesn't have 
hairdresser's block when she's putting in my natural blonde highlights <laughs> because that would be terrible. Or my uh, uh, the plumber coming to fix a drain. Oh, I have plumber's block. I can't fix your drain right now. Um, no, I I show up to the page. I write. I don't try to write the different genres on the same day though because that would kind of stop me. But I can pick up things and um, move to the next. I. With this new novel, I had to let the ideas percolate in my brain for, it's been about three months before I would even write anything. The characters were forming, the stories forming, the outline is there. And then finally, about two weeks ago, I started writing and I'm up to 20,000 words and it's just pouring out. Ah, that's fantastic. Such a great feeling too when that, when that finally reaches as you say, as it percolates, and, yeah, it gets to that boiling point, it's coming out, so it's, okay, time to write, here we go. Uh, time to write, and it's not going to be perfect, and I'm going to get it down, and then I can beef it up in places and change it, but unless I have words to play with on a paper, I, I don't have anything, so those listeners who are thinking of writing, Get the story down. Don't edit as you go. Just let it pour out and see where it goes, and then go back and work on it. There you go. I completely agree with you. Eva, thank you so, so much for joining me today. Uh, where where can people find and follow you? They can find uh, The Seer. Is that what you said? Oh, yes. Well, you, uh, you, and of course oh, the book. Oh, mm. me, yes. <laughs> and I am not, I am not the famous rock star or supermodel, so they'll have to Google Eva Shaw writer, and they find me. Otherwise, you'll think I'm the supermodel. And um, uh, the book, The Seer, is available where all books are sold. It officially comes out on September 14th, so it's in pre-sales right now, both Kindle and um, audio and, um, not audio, Kindle and book, and um, hopefully it'll just be everywhere we want it. Wonderful. All right, and as I already said, people, I'm going to have links for that in the show notes, uh, everywhere that you can find and follow Eva and the books, and, uh, and of course, the uh, Days for Girls website will be there as well. So just when you get done listening to this and you hear this chapter, save the episode, click the links down there, and uh, go check out all these wonderful things. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. It's been a delight talking to you, and I cannot wait to hear this, uh, this sample chapter. Okay, and I hope that you will enjoy the book, Jason. I hope the readers will, because that really is my goal, to write something that readers can resonate with and, and have a good time reading. Reading is escapism, and I love it. So I do, that's too. My goal. Thank I do, you. too. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is my cue. I'm going to step aside with my coffee and enjoy this sample chapter from our guest, Eva Shaw with The Seer. Chapter 1. Royal Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, February 16, 1942. Beatrix Patterson was a liar and a good one. It's for everyone's best interest, she said. I take from the rich and give to the poor. At least the second part of the statement was true. She gave herself credit for that. Tucking her film star-inspired page boy into a navy blue snood, the fishnet covering supposedly trendy at the time, the slight woman with dark circles between her eyes and a sweetly innocent appearance that made men and women instantly feel they must nurture the poor little waif, avoided looking at her reflection in the storefront mirror. Thomas Ling, however, twisted the doorknob. The front door creaked as he inhaled and moved over the threshold. Beatrix straightened. She spun around before tucking her wavy hair back into the snood. Just don't stand in the doorway. Someone might see you, she snapped at the strangers. What can I assist you in finding, sir? She sized him up as one might do with a job candidate, noting particular details, and then adjusted the scarf around her neck, making certain that it concealed the scar, white and deep, that always produced far too many questions. I know you understand English, so make a decision. If you stand there, someone will see you. She smiled in a practice way to invite confidence and used her most compelling psychic lines as she whispered, Come in, sir. I have been waiting for you. 
Looking at the man in the doorway, she continued to play the guessing game that her French nursemaid had taught her to improve her sense of observation. It was called What If. Thomas stood halfway into the office, flinched, quickly decided he could overtake the diminutive woman, but not half of the New Orleans Police Department, who seemed to be on Royal Street, stopping every man in sight. With the decision made, Thomas bowed to the occupant. Finally, he reached behind the red velvet curtains and grabbed the help-wanted inquiry within sign from the window. He nodded three times, keeping his eyes lowered. You need laundry man, missy. No, I do not. She stood and walked around the desk to be closer to the visitor and twisted the knob to lock the door. He inched into the office. Missy need houseman? I no get knackered. I good worker. Thomas's eyes widened at how quickly she moved, which bothered him more than being locked inside with her. Yet the locked door meant that if he were followed, as he had to admit seemed true, he would be safe for a time. However, his precious communication was in the laundry sack atop a wagon headed God only knew where. Your name, sir, do you use an English one, or would you prefer to be recognized in Chinese? Yes, Missy Ling, my name Ling, I good worker, you give me job. He stared at her with intensity, then demurely at his feet. You wait for me, you know me, lady? I have been waiting for you, and now please sit down. Dispense with your terrible broken English. We both know that you are British, with impeccable language skills, and you slipped up with a faulty dialect by using the word knackered, you know. She based everything on the smoothness of his hands, the use of the British sign word, the giveaway, pricey, tan, Northampton wingtip shoes. No, Missy, I work in laundry. He still diverted his gaze, but noticed the quiet of the office. The woman was alone. That was odd, because he had certainly heard an angry voice. She must have been yelling at herself. Beatrix returned to her desk. I know why you chose to come into this office rather than meet up with the police that are, at this moment, closing in on our front door. You see, I can read mine. I know things normal people cannot. It was a lie. One she used often and rolled out of her mouth. He was running for the law, so she could work with that until he revealed more. Out on the street, deep voices barked a conversation, and although Thomas could only guess what they were saying, he knew they were looking for him. If he's hiding from the police, he's either committed a crime or has no passport or documentation, she thought. And when he seemed harmless enough, Beatrix would rely on the tricks of the night trade and have him believe that she knew more about him than she could, of course. Yet there was an alternative. She could simply let him know he was safe and that all the hubbub on the street had nothing to do with him. In fact, it was a case of mistaken identity since the real felon was Japanese. Yet she said, the police are looking for someone who has assumed the disguise of a sailor, not a laundryman. She had overheard about the criminal that afternoon, but she wouldn't tell him the truth. Not yet. Before the war, Thomas had often spent evenings in a darkened cinema, never revealing to his mates or family in England that he wanted an adventurous life like Humphrey Bogart and Ronald Coleman. In fact, his life in England was so far from anything cloak and dagger that when a colleague at Cambridge asked him to retrieve an envelope to take to the address in New Orleans, he replied, most certainly I will do it, even before all the details were explained. It seemed so much like a game, like a stage play, that he and his peers had put on while he was at boarding school. How could this woman know so much especially since he had no plans to enter her office disguised as a laundry man or as a sailor he'd been impersonating just minutes before. Who had told her? Who could have? I am afraid you are mistaken, madam, Thomas said, returning to his cultured British accent. He straightened the bent posture of the laundryman and again resembled the compact scholar he was while calculating that there must be a back door on the other side of the curtain wall. Beatrix saw his gaze dart to the curtain. Do not make mistakes, sir. Kindly sit down. The back door is locked from the inside, and the key is in the desk. If you want to leave after we have finished our conversation, I will hand it over to you. But I don't think you will need it, or want it. Thomas Ling had a classical education, but he was also trained in the martial arts. It was true he had never set foot on Chinese soil, 
Nonetheless, he considered Shanghai his home. He took the guest chair and put his shoulders back against the soft green leather, his feet squarely before him and his hand clasped on his lap, yet every muscle remained alert. The questions engulfing his mind were not obvious except to the observant woman sitting across the desk. His gaze darted around the room and she knew he was in danger. Finally, Thomas realized the woman was waiting for him to speak. Madam, what is it that you want for me? My name is Beatrix Patterson. I am a seer, a knower of things. You are hiding, running from someone. It's true because I have seen it. You've lost something that's most precious to you. She hesitated, as she always did with a new client, reading his face, looking for microfacial changes. And honestly, she did see him lose the laundry bag, or at least toss it into the back of a laundry truck. His eyes widened for the briefest second, and she knew there was more. I will protect you from the police for now. They are looking for a felon and not a scientist. In return, you will become my secretary and bodyguard. I have another matter that must be completed. I cannot accept employment, nor do I want to, because you know I am a scientist? She smiled. In about five minutes, two or more police officers will bang on that door, Dr. Lang. They are looking for a small Japanese man who has impersonated a sailor. That man set fire to the munitions depot near the warehouse district. I know you are not him, and only an uneducated dolt would think you are anything but Chinese. However, these men think the worst and will not stop because you insist you are not Japanese. They are determined to apprehend someone, and even your change of clothing won't alter that, and they'll arrest you. Trust me on these facts. They will drag you to the patrol car where the worst may happen, since our entire country is horrified by the destruction that happened in Hawaii. I will explain. They'll see the truth. He stood ready to bolt. Be real, Dr. Ling. The country is at war with an Asian empire. You are Asian, even if you are Chinese and have a cultured British accent. They won't take time to discuss your heritage. I'm sorry for that. However, it's the truth. Stop talking, will you please? Beatrix shoved her palm at him, and he jumped as if he'd been cursed. Unless you immediately head to the rear of the shop, change into one of the suits and a tie you'll find in a small room near the back, they will arrest you, and your mission will come to nothing. Those who depend on you will fail, and perhaps die. The object that you have lost will be gone forever if you do not take my advice now. Thomas looked into her eyes. They were the color of pale jade, the statues his parents had displayed in their parlor. Then his gaze was drawn to her hand. The ruby ring glistened in the lamplight, making it look even bigger. With more physical outpour of fear than common sense, he dashed through the curtain opening down to the hall to the open door. It was a large supply room, and just like the woman said, there were a dozen suits lined up on racks like bodiless soldiers and stacks of old-fashioned white dress shirts. Black ties hung neatly on a rack near the door. Thomas quickly surmised that the storefront had once been a haberdashery, yet the men's fashions had not been in style for two decades. However, they seemed ready if need be. He yanked off the gritty, soiled denim trousers and the rumpled cotton shirt, tossing them to the floor to madly put on a roomy woolen suit. He grabbed the first suit he saw, not taking time to see if it was the right size. Thomas slapped a tie underneath the collar of the unstylish shirt to create a Windsor knot, and then his fingers froze as he heard pounding and shouting at the door. Uh Uh-oh, someone's knocking. Hey, that was Eva Shaw reading a sample chapter from her upcoming novel, The Seer. The book is available September 14th. The pre-order is up right now, so click that link in the show notes to grab a copy for yourself. Don't forget, 50% of the profits go to Days for Girls, nonprofit organization, and the link for that is in the show notes as well, so you can find out more about that in case you want to give more. But uh, the book is wonderful, and you're going to enjoy it. I know I'm going to enjoy it when I pick up a copy for myself. Don't forget to follow Eva and our sponsors and podcast friends alike for all their social media links. And tune in next week when I'm back with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.